after introductions like that, I can only disappoint you. All right? So uh, let's start by talking about something that's a little bit funky and cosmic and something that unites us all. So before I get started with this presentation, some of you may have heard parts of this before. The reason I'm still going to keep talking to all of you about it is until we do something about this fucking problem, you're going to keep hearing about me talking about this because we do have an issue and I do think that we need a greater amount of resolve. But that being said, um, there is something that kind of unites us all. So if you take it back to something that I find really beautiful, right? Like um, all of us in here, all of us are made of smaller things, right? We're all made of particles and subatomic particles. And the coolest thing that I heard uh, a while ago uh, was that actually the mass of an atom, which is concentrated in its nucleus of, you know, protons and neutrons, actually the mass isn't actually there. It's the binding energy, it's the stuff that's in between the neutrons and protons. It actually is the most massive thing about the actual atom. And I found this so compelling because it's like this uh, component of, of everything else that we comprise of, of all life, of all matter, of everything that we know. And I think that we forget sometimes, like also within communities and things, it's the interstitial energy, it's the stuff between us that's actually the most relevant not any one of those actual particles itself. So Einstein hated this shit. This is why he didn't actually like a lot of the conclusions that were made from all types of quantum theories that were initially espoused or Niels Bohr. So he actually called this spooky action at a distance just because he didn't want to believe that some of the predictions that would be there from quantum mechanics would actually be true. So you might be thinking, like, why the fuck is she talking about quantum mechanics? Well, it's actually really simple. It's because we're using this as the basis for a lot of the things that we see as the future of European innovation. So in Europe, we have three flagships, places where we put a billion euros. The first flagship was the human brain flagship in order to better understand the human brain. The second flagship was the uh, graphene project in order to understand how do we use the, part, the matter of graphene. And the third flagship is the quantum black flagship. And it's over a billion euros in order to understand how to keep innovation around quantum technologies and preserve the intellectual property and the scientific advancement for Europe. So it's things that you might have heard of, like quantum computing, but also quantum communications with the goal of a quantum internet, quantum simulation, and then also um, quantum sensing and metrology. So all of these areas, you, you might be thinking like, okay, that's cool that Europe is doing this. What are they actually doing? Well, they're doing a lot of work, not only on the foundational science, but also on the theories behind this that would actually support it in order to get to some RTL level and algorithms and protocols, as well as all of the actual engineering control to actually build these systems out there. So this foundational enabling science, this interstitial energy is between these two other areas of applications. We need to figure all of this out if we actually want to build things like a quantum internet that would connect quantum computers, different quantum nodes across the fabric of what we have now as today's internet to be this next revolution of, of a quantum internet where it's foundationally secure at the transmission layer. And in order for this stuff to happen, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Like, we don't know how to do quantum memory. We're still working on a quantum repeater. We need to be able to have this bandwidth go all across the fabric of the current internet we currently have. And right now, when you look at how these underlying quantum communications technologies are built, they require dedicated fiber between the two parties, between Alice and Bob, that are communicating. You know, that's a difficult thing to achieve. So just thinking about all of the stuff that we need for repeaters, memories, nodes, and then being able to do this not just on land, but in space, it's a tall order. But the thing that you keep hearing about are things that revolve around a quantum computer. By the way, how, how many of you have been paying attention to news over a quantum computer above the news over AI? Above, really? Okay, you're weird, Chris, we knew that. But um, 
the people who have been doing that are actually in the minority. So it would be better if we had more hands up. But there is a lot of work happening here. And there's a lot of players that are still activating in stealth. And one of the foundational things that I always like to say is it's inevitable that we will have a quantum computer. And that's because we've gotten so addicted on the heroin junkiness that is Moore's Law. Everybody knows what Moore's Law is, right? I see a lot of nods. Anyone not know what it is? Don't be shy. This is your opportunity to go, or you can ask Google. Yeah, okay. Thank you for raising your hand. Moore's Law is roughly that every 18 months, we double our computing power. What makes Moore's Law super interesting is that there's an asymmetric decline in the amount that it costs. So you keep getting more goods at lower cost. Sounds like capitalism? Because it, no, okay. Well, the point is that we've gotten addicted to this Moore's Law phenomenon. We keep thinking that we keep adding hardware, we keep getting more and more compute. We, we want to do more. We want to have better selfies. So that's why, you know, like this Moore's Law thing, it's going to keep going. But we're seeing the emergence of something else called Amdahl's Law, which is you can e keep adding this hardware but you're actually not getting the equivalent um, rise in your computing power. So you're actually seeing it taper off. And because of this emergence of Amdahl, that we're not actually getting more, we need to find a different type of architecture that will still support this exponential drive, this need for us to have more and more ability to solve large data set problems and needle and haystack problems. We're not going to have quantum computers that are like sitting underneath our, our desks necessarily, but they are going to be able to fundamentally answer some very uh, foundational scientific problems that we have. And there's a lot of promise around it. There's not just promise, by the way, there's a ton of hype. So a quantum computer, you know, is going to solve climate change, it's going to fix cancer, it's going to, this is the hype that's around it, and all of the things, pick your favorite topic du jour, uh, a quantum computer is going to eradicate that problem. This is obviously not true. There's a ton of more hype than there is actual potential. That being said, what I find incredibly encouraging is that all the big players, Google, Microsoft, IBM, you name it, all of the big players, plus a whole bunch of small ones, Honeywell, you know, like there's a whole bunch of people that are actually working on developing quantum computers. And what's really interesting is that if you take a look at the roadmap, for example, of IBM, the most impressive thing about it is that every time they put out a roadmap for 2023 or 2022, they actually have hit it. Have you guys ever had project management in your company? When do they actually ever hit it? All right? So the purely impressive fact is there's a damn good project management here who's actually, like, you know, lowering expectations but actually hitting those uh, things that are communicated externally. So I find this incredibly impressive that they've actually done what they said they were going to do. Um, what I do need to tell you about, and again, like, please don't be shy. So why is a quantum computer so cool? Um, is because of the fact that there are certain properties about a quantum computer that foundationally differ from what we have with our current computing technology. And you might have heard it said before, hey, quantum computer uses qubits instead of classical bits. So classical bits are zeros and ones. Everybody's comfortable? Still comfortable? Right. And a, a qubit is a zero and a one at the same time. So at the same time, you would have a zero or a one. You would have a zero and a one uh, superposition, my fingers are all backwards, it's Halloween, I can't tell you. But you'll have the zero and the one superpositioned at the same time. And I want you to think about this as an opportunity space, where before you had one opportunity, it could be a zero or it could be a one, now you have two opportunities with the qubit. Are we good on that concept? You got two for the price of one. We're good, right? We're in the Netherlands. We love those kinds of bargains. I'm joking, sorry, sorry, below the belt, I know. Um, and so what really is cool about this potential is that when you combine it with another principle of quantum mechanics called entanglement, this was the spooky action we're referring to, you actually can exponentially increase this opportunity state. So we had, in regular classic computing, we had the zero or the one. Now we have the zero and the one at the same time. Now what we're going to do is we're going to pair it with another qubit. Okay, so when we have this over here, we've got this interaction over here. So we've got one qubit going like this and another qubit going like this. When we combine them together, how many opportunity states do I have with two qubits? Four. 
because don't say 16, because we can count my hands, right? Like one cubit is two opportunities. Another one over there. I heard 16. Don't be shy. It's okay. But the other one is over here, so that's four, right? And the way that we look at how many of these opportunity spaces they are is we say two to the n, where n is the amount of qubits. So if I have two qubits and it's two to the second power, it's four. We have not all had coffee. Come on. Okay, and if I take three qubits and I entangle them, how many do I have? Eight. If I have four qubits, I have... You get the idea. So if I have the fastest supercomputer on Earth and I want to double it, I need to build another supercomputer next to it, right? If I want to double the power of a quantum computer, what do I do? Add one qubit. All you need is one fucking qubit, and you've doubled your computing power. It's not every 18 months, all right? We add one qubit. We double the computing power. And that's why this quantum computing revolution is inevitable. It's going to be there because we are addicted to this exponential scale of the scaling of all of our computing power. Is that idea clear? Okay. There's also some other cool things for all the security folks in the room, which is that, you know, quantum states are finicky. They are incredibly fa fragile. They decohere, you know? They're like, oh my gosh, they flake out if they know that there's some sort of noise or jitter or error or if there's actually an observation because then the wave function that they're in collapses and they become from a probabilistic state of that opportunity state that I was telling you about to a deterministic state. It becomes the zero or the one, not both. Okay, so they don't like when you try to do a replay attack. They don't like when you try to copy or surveil the communications that are happening at a quantum level. So they have this fragility, no cloning, no copying, no eavesdropping principle. That's pretty neat for all the things we want to do in security. But there's something that's even more relevant to us as security folk, which is the foundational threat that a sizable quantum computer with enough qubits poses to our current cryptography. So all over the internet, every day of our lives, we're using cryptography. If you go online, you know, you're using cryptography. You guys all know this. Not everyone knows this, unfortunately. But we know that we have cryptography that's based on some hard math problems. And these hard math problems are one-way functions. They're easy to do in one direction and hard to do in another. The two hard ma math problems that we've based it on is integer factorization and discrete log. And again, I know you've not had enough coffee, but we're going to do some more math. So here's the deal. Uh, I love this particular example, the dude that's got this great smile. Yeah, that's you. What's nine times eight? Okay, they helped you. Go ahead, rest of audience. 72. Thank you very much. So nine times eight is 72. All right, same dude with a wonderful smile. Hello. No, it's okay. You also have great hair. So, um, no, no, dude, no pressure. So what are all the factors that you can multiply together to get 72? And? Yes. So, but you get the idea. If we say 9 times 8, the audience got it a bit quicker, but it's pretty quick for us to say 9 times 8 is 72. But to go the other direction, if you have 72, to then factor all of the numbers you needed to get there, it takes us a little while, right? Yeah? The way that our brains work is the same way that our current computing architecture works. It takes a while. So there's this dude uh, named uh, Love Grover and Peter Shore. And Peter Shore basically wrote an algorithm to reverse this one-way fa function of integer factorization. He already did it before there was ever this notion of a quantum computer that would be there to actually run the algorithm against. Not a notion. There was a notion, but before we had the architecture to be able to do it. Okay, we still can't run Schroer's algorithm on the current computing architecture we have, but I argue that that's a matter of time. And then, like, the other problem that we have with our current uh, cryptography is discrete log, which is like clock arithmetic. So the same idea holds true. If you have 3 to the 16th with a modulus of 17, modulus means remainder, the answer is 1. But if you only have this answer... 
to reverse it to the formula that got you there is hard. Okay? So this idea is sure has the algorithm to do the integer factorization. Grover has an optimization path that'll allow you to try multiple possibilities all at once. And the two together means an exponential decline in the amount of time that you would need in order to reverse this one way function. Are we good on this concept? All right. Any questions? Okay. So you guys also know that in order for an attacker to think about how do I attack a particular target, they're not just looking at the cryptography. Why bother with the cryptography unless you have secure hardware, operating systems, protocols, applications? Is there anyone in the room that feels that they've got a good handle on the first four things in this slide? Right. And you have it. So if we don't have this, applying good crypto on top of it, Although still a good practice, you know, is not always the easiest point of attack for an attacker. So an attacker is going to attack the soft underbelly, which are our weak protocols, weak hardware and operating systems, and bloody weak applications first before they go after the cryptography. And even when we have all of these things, you still need to understand what it is we're trying to protect from whom. And that kind of situational awareness is also sorely lacking. Again, how many of you feel confident that every single thing that you've ever put out as an organization has the appropriate threat modeling associated with it? Right? If we don't do that, we can forget doing all this difficult, complicated shit. And then the biggest question here is when? You know, when do I have a quantum computer that's actually capable of doing this? I want to talk about something for a second. So this is the NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, the recommended key length for RSA. Okay? And then when you take a look at the time that it needs to factor uh, an L-bit number, and we're saying, like, in, in general, it takes a long time. If you're using some of these things, it takes a long time. Without a quantum computer, it could take, you know, a couple of billion years to actually factor some of these algorithms. But if you have a quantum computer with a significant amount of qubits, then eventually what you can get is this exponential speed up. So something that would have taken you like millions of billions of years, will suddenly take you a couple of seconds. Okay? Exponential speed up in order to do the integer factorization. There's also one more problem. So Etsy has said one of our biggest issues is the capture now, decrypt later problem. This is a picture of the Utah Data Center facility in the United States. It's a real picture. It's a real facility. And what they do, and you'll, there's papers about it as well, by the way. So, and it's not even a Snowden thing. It's like, this is a known thing. They make snapshots of the internet from different collection points, and they're specifically looking for encrypted traffic. So they're looking for encrypted traffic in order to store it and look for opportunities to see how it can be broken. Because old secrets are sometimes just as good as new secrets because of the predictive force that they have. Um, and the impact, when you take a look at like what's actually at stake, everything is at stake. And even AES, you know, the NSA advice on Suite B already started with you need a larger key size for uh, AES, and for the SHA hashes, you need a larger output. But foundationally, because of the key encryption mechanisms, everything needs to be changed, everything. And that's exactly why we're trying to change all of the algorithms that we would use in a post-quantum future. And when you want to ask yourself, okay, interesting, but you already told us that you know, no one's going to break the crypto if they're going to break any of the soft underbelly. So how do I know what I need to do in this area? Well, you start by asking a couple of questions. How long do you actually need to keep your encryption secure? Let's, let's take a, a look at something. Um, does anybody work in healthcare? Yeah. Oh, thank you for being volunteer. So can I just ask you, how long do you think you need to keep your data secure? No patient wants their data out there. Okay. So if you're 23 and me, and we're not just talking about a relative's thing, you know, the recent breach, but you actually talked about their actual data, how long do you need to keep that secure? Forever. Someone said forever. Who said that? Oh, there you go. Really, forever? Well, we don't know how to do that. But how about just your lifetime? Yes, the progeny as well. So your lifetime and your kid's lifetime. And their kid's lifetime? Yes. Yeah. Again, we don't know how to do We can't even do your lifetime. Let me be really clear. We cannot right now 
keep encryption secure for your lifetime, assuming that you don't, you know, drink too much and do MDMA tonight and then crash violently. Um, so as long as those things don't happen, uh, we don't know how to do this, all right? And then s the second question, how long do we have before there's actually a viable quantum computer that actually does attack us? When you talk to scientists in Europe, um, they will tell you that between the next 10 years to 15 years, we will already have a quantum computer. And by the way, the, even the skeptics, the quantum skeptics will tell you that it'll be about 15 years. It's the optimists that tell you that are, it's already there, we just don't know about it in the public domain. That's what the optimists will say. But anyway, so that. And then finally, how long, this is my biggest worry, frankly, how long do we need to transition our network and systems to one that is quantum safe? Any ideas? Thank you. That means equivalently, we're fucked. Okay? That's the summary of that. We, we are not great with change. We're really bad with change. So uh, as a matter of fact, when you take a look at the kinds of changes, there are spoons of really easy things, but we find it very hard to do. The first and foremost thing, increase the key length of the current crypto we use. How many of you know within your organizations which crypto you use? Okay. Less than 10%. No, no, less than 10%. Okay? Less than 10%. And then subsequently, investigate the options, if it makes sense, for very specific points in your network for something like QKD. Okay? Not everywhere. It's not ubiquitous. Unless it becomes ubiquitous, it's not really an option for a lot of people. And then finally, what I believe in the most, post-quantum algorithms. And then, like, let's talk about quantum key distribution. I mentioned this really early on. We don't all have dedicated fiber between us and the people we communicate with. So that is a fundamental issue. Eve, the eavesdropper, will, you know, not be able to uh, intercept the quantum channel between Alice and Bob without Alice and Bob knowing about it. The way that it actually works is we have a set of polarizers, diagonal and horizontal. It's like sunglasses. You guys know polarized sunglasses? It let lights, it's letting light in one way, but if you turn it by uh, 90 degrees, it doesn't let it in the other way, right? So there's a set of polarizers. The configuration of these polarizers need to be communicated over an offline channel. If Eve is actually sitting in the mix between Alice and Bob's uh, communication, there's a shift of everything that Alice tries to send to Bob. So Bob gets gibberish. Is that notion clear? Basically, it's all about Eve. We're looking for Eve when we try to do this setup of QKD. Okay? And obviously, because we don't have this fiber uh, between everyone you communicate with currently on the internet, by the way, if you do have that, I'd love to know who you are, and I'd like to understand which bunker you're living in. But uh, that being said, free space QKD is like one of the most interesting, promising things that's out there. This was one of the first experiments that was ever done. It was in Europe. But it is quickly surpassed by the Chinese experiment that was done in 2016, where they launched the world's first quantum communication satellite, subsequently put down initially a couple of thousand kilometers. Now it's over 10,000 kilometer quantum network all over China. Everyone is participating. It's not just the government. There's public institutions, news agencies. It's a complete encrypted network across China terrestrially. And because of what they've been able to do with Misius, their satellite, and the second satellite that they've launched, they're able to have video conference calls that are fully post-quantum encrypted uh, between Beijing and Vienna. So it's not just regionally within China. It's everywhere. And it's interesting from the perspective of that it actually spurred on a whole bunch of scientific missions to do this kind of stuff in space uh, because of Misius all over the world, from Japan to the U.S. and, you know, all over, everywhere. And the predominant uh, look for that was looking at critical infrastructure. How can we have critical infrastructure projects that would then subsequently benefit from this type of encrypted communications. But I actually think we're going to go a different direction when we actually make this viable commercially. Space infrastructure, thanks to Elon and Jeff, I feel like we're on a first name basis now, but um, thanks to them, you know, there's a ton of space infrastructure. And I think the biggest thing that you're going to see is just like the early days of the internet, we're going to have to figure out ways to share those communications infrastructures between these two parties, even if it's only for interconnect and billing, like the early mobile networks or the early internet. So I, I really expect us to think about doing this 
type of secure communications link only for that type of sharing. And also, because we already see, like Vodafone's already announced that they're going to put a 4G network on the moon, again, for s space tourists to send selfies, because why else did we build the internet, right? So uh, because that's all going to happen, I really expect us to see more of this. I think the only biggest thing I would have as a word of caution before we get all excited about you know, lasers in space is that we still need to think this through before we get too excited about you know, what is the resilience that we're trying to build? How does it actually like, improve our overall security? And what are the concerns around supply chain security? And by the way, we're putting something in orbit. It's not easy to get to. So we really need to think it through in terms of the notion of crypto agility. If I need to change stuff, if I need to fix stuff that's broken, that's not that easy. That's why I believe much more strongly in post-quantum cryptographic algorithms, algorithms, because I do think that it offers a degree of flexibility and extensibility over our current internet infrastructure that is much more resilient, even though it you know, bears testing. So if you take a look at where we are now, we are uh, waiting for the standard to be finalized, which will be, be done next year. This year in February, we had a meeting with Etsy, which you know, co-pairs with NIST um, on these post-quantum algorithms. There's going to be another call for a set of digital signature algorithms, but we already have a bunch of algorithms that you can already now play with and experiment in your networks. So we have a bunch of finalists and we also have a bunch of alternates. I'm going to talk about this in a minute. Um, but I want to make it clear that we already have this, even though there's been a secondary uh, call for additional digital signatures. Yeah? And I do want to, again, caution us from getting all too excited at once because we all know Things have gone horribly wrong in the past. So a couple of words to everybody here. I really hope that we get our hands dirty, that we go and play with these algorithms. But please, word of caution, please do not roll your own crypto, okay? And we know that there is going to be efforts to do cryptanalysis even when we have these new algorithms. We know there's going to be additional traffic analysis on any supplementary metadata. We know. And we still know that the KXCD comic is the most true. No one's going to build a quantum computer to crack this shit if you can just use the... By the way, did you guys all see what Scattered Spider or you know the comm does in terms of their aggressive... The guys who hacked MGM, right? They bully incredibly aggressively uh, people into giving up login credentials. So guys know the MGM ransomware case. I know it's just cybersecurity stuff, but the point is that like those are the bullying tactics that some cyber gangs will use in order to get credentials to have an initial point of attack into organizations. So I don't want us to underestimate that either. And I do want us to think about how we can build like systems that are not just good technical ones, but good social ones as well. You can have the best fucking crypto on earth, but if you have key escrow and all this other shit, you're lost. If you have additional powers granted to your intelligence agencies without any supervision and you give up the tip, you're lost. This is a small, slight social commentary. Uh, but I really think that we need to take every examination of any argument to weaken or ban or you know, do other types of endangering of our civil liberties by harming cryptography incredibly seriously and look for alternatives. And when it comes to post-quantum cryptography, some of you said it already, you know which cryptography you're using in your organizations. Most don't. Most have no idea. So the first place that it starts is understanding that crypto is an asset. And I don't mean currency. Your cryptography is an asset. You have to think it through when you start playing with these algorithms for how you're going to do your implementation. And look for opportunities for stuff to break and have alternatives. Make sure you have policies for your innovation areas. Engage with your hardware and software vendors because you're not going to build it all yourself. You're going to have Cisco and Juniper and the usual suspects building shit in for you. They better start early because they're going to fuck it up later with time to market. So think about how you have your own roadmap to readiness that maps against what you just saw from NIST's roadmap. 
right? Start this whole understanding of what you have, this awareness creation within your org. Start prepping your stuff. Make sure you start doing discovery and engagement with those uh, suppliers. You know, think through, again, very specific implementation steps where you're going to test and pilot and test again. And then think about what you do when stuff goes south and it breaks because you cannot just swap your current cryptography for some PQC algorithm at the last minute because it will not work. There are considerations around bandwidth and processor performance, so you actually need to test this stuff. So when you think about it, you know, let's be clear. If you're not doing the basics, I'll say this again, if you're not doing any of the basic, so-called basics, right? If you don't have a knowledge of your own network, if you don't know what you're using, if you don't do vulnerability management, if you don't do you know, basic security and privacy stuff, then do that first. Do that first before you do crypto stuff. But at the same time, you do need to engage and start now because it's really no point in making sure that we're only doing the things that are urgent and not doing the things that are important. So I urge you to consider what's important before you only prioritize urgent. And then think about how you engage with vendors. You can snapshot this, but like you should have a third-party risk management system probably somewhere where you do procurement. Ask them a couple of questions. Ask them, what are they doing? Where's their roadmap? You know, what's their expectation about when they're going to communicate that they have these additional set of algorithms ready to go for your use? And then think about experimenting with very specific products. There's already VPNs out there that you can use that are already implementing post-quantum cryptographic algorithms. You can do this now. You don't have to wait. So my biggest thing to you is to understand that there should be a sense of urgency now. And while I, I want to kind of say that you have to have that sense of urgency now, you also need to be in shape in order to evaluate threats. So you might have seen that one of the alternative algorithms on there was Psyche. Psyche was broken with not a quantum computer, but with, by the way, does everybody know what I'm saying when I say Psyche? Yes, and I see a lot of no's. Okay, so I'm just gonna go back really quickly. So I mentioned that you had alternate algorithms, Psyche. This is one of the ones that came out from NIST. So what we actually had, uh, right, is Psyche was actually broken, and not with a quantum computer, in fact, with a very old computer. My point is that that started a sort of cascade where people were calling it the cryptocopolypse, you know? That there's this, it, it's just complete fear, uncertainty, doubt. I want us to be able to find our friends in this area to make sure that we are better in shape of evaluating actual threats without the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So if we think about how we get started, it's really like important to recognize, just like everything else we do in InfoSec, this is also a journey. And we just need to get started now. It's a process of iteration and improvement. We can do it as long as we work together. And if we find our friends, whether it's an Isaac or CERT, you know, I just want you to all get your hands dirty and tell each other about it. Because right now we're also not sharing failures, which is super important in order to understand what worked and what didn't work. There's two reports here. You can give it to your management peeps. Um, they're both from the World Economic Forum. I had the opportunity to work on both of them. Um, and they're good reports. So they tell you about the current state of quantum computing, as well as what you need to do to get ready for this transition. And here's the thing, the only reason to get this and give it to your management peeps is so you have the money and the time and the FTE to actually work on it. All right. If you have any questions, thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate, like this is a really weird topic to start, but I want you to appreciate this notion of this is spooky action. It may be at a distance, but not for long. Thank you.